Genesis 18, we're going to begin reading in verse 16 and read through the end at verse 33. Hear God's Word. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again he spoke to him and said, Suppose forty are found there. He answered, For the sake of forty I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. He answered, For the sake of twenty, I will, not do it. I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again but this once. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Father, it is now particularly around your word that we come. And we come asking for the help of your Holy Spirit who inspired your word to grant us the ability to understand it rightly, to grant me the ability to divide it rightly for your people, to give your people eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand what you have for us in your word. Help us, Father, in this text, as in all pages of Scripture, that we would open to see Jesus Christ clearly put forward that we might proclaim the excellencies of His great and marvelous name. In Him we pray. Amen. Well, we pick up in the middle of chapter 18 this week where we left off last week, but it's not a completely illogical place to, to stop and then pick back up again. Even in the original language, there seems to be a bit of a break here in the scenes that we have. Just to recount for you, if you weren't here last week in Genesis chapter 18, we see these three men appear to Abraham. And I owe you some apologies because I said in my introduction last week that one of the things we have to do is answer who these men are. And I don't think I ever actually did that. So... You might have picked up on the language some as I preached or even as I spoke to the kids this week or in other conversations we've had. But essentially what we learn as we work through this passage is that these three men are God himself, possibly a pre-incarnate Christ, and two angels with him. One of the reasons that we know that is because it is one man usually speaking when the scriptures say that the Lord speaks and it uses God's covenant name, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the name of Yahweh, just in an English transliteration. And then as we'll see next week when we come to chapter 19 verse 1, it says the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. So it would appear that these three men, no matter what the, the particulars of their manifestation are, are pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, and two angels joining him for the mission that he has. And so these three men come, God and his two angels, and, and they have a meal with Abraham. 
And we talked about how this was sort of the final cap on the covenant that God is entering into with Abraham. We saw all the way back in Genesis 12 this promise made to Abraham. We saw a covenant ceremony take place in Genesis 15 whenever Abraham came and tore animals in two and God put him to sleep and God himself walked through the pieces of the animal saying that if the covenant is broken that God would bear the consequences for the breaking of that covenant. This is a monergistic covenant. It is one God working to keep and to make this covenant. Nevertheless, God comes back in Genesis 17 and has an amendment to the covenant and gives the covenant sign of circumcision to Abraham, and not only to Abraham, but also to his offspring and all those who are in his household. And we talked about how God takes his covenant seriously, and because God takes his covenant seriously, he takes his covenant signs seriously. And when God enters into a covenant, he does not do so merely with one individual, but God enters into covenant with his covenant people. God deals communally, covenantally, familially with his people, not on a merely individualistic basis. And so the beginning of chapter 18 we saw last week was this covenant meal that was common whenever a treaty was entered into in those days in the Middle East. The two kings would come, they would enter their covenant, they would have their covenant ceremony, a sign of that covenant would be established, and then they would share a meal together, symbolizing that there was peace between them and there would no longer be war and there would no longer be strife. And so we see Abraham, the covenant representative that God had entered into this covenant with, and God coming to say to him, peace be unto you. Let there be peace between me and between you. And then we hear God recount for Abraham the promises that he had made to them, that about that time next year God would return and Sarah would bear a son. And Sarah is standing sort of behind Abraham in the tent with her back to the tent door, and she overhears this and she sort of laughs to herself because she's 99 years old and a promise is being made that she's going to make love to her husband and have a baby. It all sounds a little bit silly, even to us today, and it sounded silly back to her then. But nevertheless, we learn from that that God commonly takes what seems absolutely impossible and does it anyway. And He does it for His purposes. He does it that he might bring to fulfillment what he has promised to his people. Even when it seems like there's no way it could possibly ever happen that way, God makes that happen. And so now God, having given this promise to Abraham, and having had this meal with Abraham, and having made the the manifestation of the promise proclaimed to Sarah, we come to verse 16, where it says, Then the men, presumably all three, set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom. Now, for anybody that's been in a church even once in their lifetime, when they hear the name Sodom, they're they're not completely ignorant of that idea. We've even begun to call a particular sexual activity sodomy. It's gotten its whole own verbal category because of the story surrounding Sodom and likewise their counterpart, Gomorrah. For us, when we come to Sodom here in this part of the biblical narrative, we need to remember what I just recounted with the children. Remember, at this point, Abraham has come into the land that God has promised to give him. And Abraham has established himself essentially as a king in this land amongst other kings. And it would appear as if Abraham's doing pretty well for himself because at this point, nobody's declared war against Abraham. Abraham's just simply going about his business. But remember, Abraham has this knucklehead nephew named Lot who kind of keeps causing problems for Abraham. Lot didn't want to share in the inheritance with Abraham, and and Abraham's shepherds and Lot's shepherds couldn't get along, and so they had separated. And Lot had went and dwelt near the land of Sodom, and apparently had fallen into life with the Sodomites. And so whenever the Sodomites make war against other kings in the land to try to establish prominence for themselves, Lot gets taken captive as a prisoner of war. Remember we talked about how there Abraham is, probably just, you know, whittling his staff, just enjoying the nice peace that he has gained for himself. And then he hears news that his nephew Lot has gotten himself taken captive. And so Abraham then goes into war. And remember what happened? Abraham almost effortlessly defeats these other kings and saves the king of Sodom and those who were at war with him as well and his nephew Lot. And remember that interesting scene that took place where this priest named Melchizedek just kind of pops up out of nowhere? and blesses Abraham and blesses God Most High, and and Abraham offers a tithe to this Melchizedek. We talked about how this is a, a, a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But then after that occurrence, there's the king of Sodom trying to haggle with Abraham, 
trying to make a deal with him regarding the spoil. And what does Abraham say? You take for yourself all that's been won. Simply make sure that my men get their required portion. Because you will not say that you have made Abraham rich. Abraham is already in the practice at this time of ensuring that whatever blessing comes to him, his primary focus is to glorify God and to make God famous, to make God's name great, not his own name. And so as we come to Genesis eighteen sixteen, and we see that these men set their face towards Sodom, we have these stories in the back of our mind of the wickedness that we learn in chapter 13 of the people of Sodom, of their uh, supposed arrogance and their thinking that they can just go to war and, and, and win the war and, and rise to prominence, of their arrogance and thinking that they can make a servant of the Most High rich by their means of haggling. Nothing really seems to be speaking much good of these people. So what is God going to do with these people? As we read on, we find out. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. They have finished their meal at this point, maybe rested for a little while. They've had their conversations, and Abraham is sort of seeing them out the door. You're familiar with this practice. You have somebody over to your house for dinner. You finish the meal. You exchange some pleasantries. Maybe you have a glass of wine or two. And whenever it starts to get about the certain point of time where somebody needs to go to bed, it's usually me, you politely see them towards the door. Abraham sees these men towards the door. And verse 17 says, The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. We need to understand here that as God speaks this way, that it is not as if God has doubt within himself. Whenever Scripture uh, re reveals God speaking in such humanistic terms, we need to understand that it is using a rhetorical tool known as condescension. That God is simply trying to condescend to us here and illustrate how it is that the story is taking place. We, we would think much the same way in our heads if we had a bit of information about somebody or for somebody that we maybe gained in a, in a way that we weren't sure about, and we would question whether or not we should share it with them. We could look like we're possibly gossiping, or we could look like we're trying to manipulate the situation. God obviously has no such concerns for himself. God simply here is ramping up getting ready to reveal once again something to Abraham. God has already made his promises to Abraham, so it's very unlikely that what's about to proceed is another promise to him. And clearly it has something to do with the people of Sodom because it is upon them looking down towards Sodom that this thought seems to come to the man representation here for God. Shall I hide from Abraham what it is that I am about to do? What is it that he is about to do to Sodom? Notice his reasoning here for why it is that he feels the need to tell Abraham, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Why is it that God would ever feel the need to reveal to his people his purposes and his will? Simply because of who they are. Because they are his people. Because whenever God enters into a covenant with somebody, He not only enters into that covenant and then lets things lie as they are, but God then continues to participate in covenant with His people, and His people likewise continue to participate in covenant relation with Him as well. And so as God's covenant people, we do indeed receive special insight into the very will of God. Now at this point we need to be clear that Abraham here off and on serves sort of as a prophet, a priest, and a king. He's already sort of served as a priest in the way that he's interceded for Lot, and he's going to serve as a priest later in the rest of this passage. But at this point here, he's serving as a prophet because he is receiving the revealed will of God. We need to get our theology straight and understand that people no longer receive direct manifestation of God's will anymore. If you want to know what God is saying to you, crack open your Bible. If you feel like it needs to be audible, read it out loud. So we're not looking anymore for prophecy. We're not looking for God to, to manifest Himself physically in front of us and to tell us things. But nevertheless, as the new covenant people of God, we learn from this that the people of God do, and see, do indeed receive particular insight into the will of God. And we do so by the Holy Scriptures and by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us to understand what it is that the Scriptures say. It says, seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, God's participation towards Abraham is intricately linked to his promises that he has made to him. But notice this, that God has not made promises to Abraham, nor does God make promises to you or to I because of anything within ourselves. God doesn't make a promise to Abraham because he's so awesome. 
because he's so great or because he does everything right. Remember what we learned about him back before he got to this point in the story? Abraham was a son of a pagan. He himself was a pagan worshiper. Abraham had a wife who was barren. Therefore, they could not have children. Particularly, they could not have a son. Therefore, their marriage could not be truly consummated as it was in that culture. And Abraham was enamored with earthly riches. He doesn't exactly sound like the kind of person the God of the universe would choose to establish a covenant with. But that is exactly what God does. That is exactly what God does. God makes covenants with people that left to themselves don't deserve it at all to carry out His purposes. Look at what it says in verse 19. For I have chosen Him. The the Hebrew word here for chosen could also be translated, I have known Him. It's the exact same verb that gets used whenever it says that Adam knew his wife Eve. God knows Abraham in an intimate relational way. I have chosen Him. I know Him. The prophet Jeremiah would say that God knew him before he was formed in his mother's womb. And that's exactly how God knows you and I. In his covenant with us having been decreed from before the ages began, God chose us. And God chose Abraham not because of any goodness in him, but because it was so fitting to fulfill God's purposes. I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. God chose me and it is a monergistic salvation. So therefore God does it all and I don't have to do anything. In regards to your salvation, absolutely. Our salvation is indeed monergistic. It is is a one God act, that God acts in our salvation. But when God acts, God calls. And when God calls, God calls you to something particular. What God calls you to particularly is obedience to His revealed will. And God's commandments for you that you are to respond to in obedience are not out of line with the covenant that He has made. Remember, the covenant was made with Abraham and with his offspring and with all those within his household. And look what it says here about God having chosen him, that He may command His children and His household after Him to keep the way of the Lord. Calvin sees in here an application to the responsibility of heads of household to lead their wives and their children and any others that may be under their care in the truths of what God says in His Word. Men, that is our call. That is our call to uphold these truths of the gospel and to proclaim them boldly to our wives and to our children and to be diligent in our teaching of them. To lead in the way of not only everyday worship in our homes, but also in corporate worship here in the life of the church. This is what men of the New Testament are called to. To command our children and our households after God in the way of the Lord. And to not only that, but also beyond the teaching, there's an activity that that takes place. By doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Augustine is famous for saying that whatever God, that God command what you will and will what you command. That is exactly the way that God operates. God comes, God chooses. God enacts salvation on our behalf. God gifts unto a sinner the Holy Spirit. The ability to believe takes the heart of stone, makes it into a heart of flesh, enables them to believe and trust in Jesus Christ, and then sets them in a way of living in accordance with the guidance of that Holy Spirit that they might live in just such a way. God does all this that He might bring about His promises. You see, our justification, our sanctification isn't as separate as sometimes we might like to think that it is. For one is a mere logical outplay of the other, those who have just, are justified, indeed are being sanctified, and will indeed be glorified. Those whom God has chosen will keep the way of the Lord and will instruct their children and their households in it and will keep justice and righteousness that they might see God's promises come to fruition. And so because God has established such a covenant with Abraham, and because God deals with Abraham in just such a way, and because God deals with me and you much in the same way as He did here with our father Abraham, God is kind enough to condescend to reveal to us particulars of His will. In verse 20, He says to Abraham, Then the Lord said, 
because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. This is not the first time that we've heard of God hearing a cry in the book of Genesis up to this point. Remember what happened whenever Cain slew Abel? God came and said that your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. God is a holy God. God is a righteous God. God is a just God. And a holy, righteous, just God hears the cry of injustice and unrighteousness and unholiness from the heavenly places. God is a God that hears. God is a God that hears the outcries of His people against the sins and the wickedness committed against them. Now, we have to ask a question at this point that we'll answer in part now and deal with just a little bit more in just a second. But who is it exactly that's crying out? You see, whenever the blood of Abel crying out is spoken of, it seems as if it formulates from within the blood itself and cries out. But, but, but here, it's not the outcry from Sodom. And it's not the outcry from Gomorrah. It's the outcry against them. Remember, here in this land that Abraham has come to, here are all these kings and all these communities that have been set up dwelling together with one another. So what do you think happens whenever the wickedness of one begins to bleed over into another one? Anybody in here the kind of person that keeps a really well-tended yard? Not me. I'm the other guy. I'm the guy next door to you whose grass is about knee high and you're really ticked off about it because you can't seem to remember exactly where it is that your property line is and where it is that you stop mowing because you're not about to mow my yard for me. Much in the same way, this neighboring wickedness of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah begins to creep into the other communities surrounding it. And so the righteous of the Lord cry out here. But it's also possible that Lot himself and his family are the ones crying out. You see, at this point, Lot hasn't quite gotten into Sodom. He's going to. We're coming to that. But here Lot is. Righteous Lot, as Peter calls him. And once again, we have to remember that when we speak of Lot as being righteous, that should indeed baffle us. Because nothing all that great has been revealed about Lot up to this point. We keep calling him a knucklehead, and the reason we keep doing that is because that's exactly what he seems to be, a knucklehead. Lot's that ignorant young nephew who who just does everything silly that you wish he would never do. And it continues to inconvenience you and get in your way of what you're trying to do that you should be doing. But nevertheless, the Apostle Peter in his letter comes to Lot and says, Righteous Lot, for that righteous man's righteous soul was tormented day and night because of the wickedness of the people of Sodom. What cry is it that goes up to the Lord? It's the cry of the righteous. God is a God, a righteous God, that hears the cry of His righteous people that are righteous and call out to Him, not because of themselves, but because of what God has done in choosing them. The righteous cry out and God hears. Now, God hears, and we'll see here next in verse 21 that God not only hears, but God also sees. He says, I will go down to see, verse 21, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Now, of course, we are dealing with the omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient God of the universe here. Why is it that he has to come down if he's already heard? Why is it that he has to come down and see? Can he not see it from the heavenly realm? Well, a couple of things to note here. First of all, again, this is condescending language. It's not that God could not have known without coming down. God certainly could have. So we don't pit this truth against other truths of what the Bible says about God Himself. But what it does show us is this, is that God will leave absolutely no room for critics to ever cry out to Him concerning His justice and His righteousness. Rather than simply declaring God can hear everything, God can see everything, and God is everywhere, and God can do everything, God shows that. And he condescends, having not only heard the wickedness, but he comes down to see it. He comes down to see it, that whatever decision he establishes in light of what it is he will do in response to the wickedness or the injustice that he might see, there can be no question about the manner in which he has acted. God hears the outcry, and God comes down to see The language here when it says, I will go down to see whether they have done all together according to the outcry could also be that whether or not it has met the full measure of the outcry or whether or not it has come to completion in relation to the outcry. What God is doing is He is establishing that exactly what He has heard, 
is exactly what he has seen and is exactly what is being done that no charge would be able to be established against him. That no one might cry out, why have you made me this way? Has the potter no right over the clay? And who are you, O man, to answer back to God? And so God, having revealed these particulars to his covenant representative in Abraham, proceeds to verse 22. The men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Here we have another indication that this is a pre-incarnate Christ and two angels who are coming to carry out this purpose of God. The two men turn towards Sodom and go, Abraham still stands before God, and they have a little chat about what it is that they have just heard. You ever read something in the Scriptures and gone, well, wait a minute, let me read that again. Abraham actually hears God's Word and says, wait a minute. And he needs to have a conversation with the Lord about this. Notice how Abraham carries himself here. Verse 23, Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And and of course, what Abraham is asking there is exactly what maybe you and I should be asking ourselves. Would God indeed do such a thing? Would God give to the righteous the exact same punishment that He would to the wicked? And of course, we would be right in concluding that if he were to do so, he actually wouldn't be righteous. He actually wouldn't be just to treat the righteous and the wicked in the same manner. That's not justice. Abraham goes on and says, verse 24, Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will then you sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Now, we read this section earlier. You know how this goes. Abraham begins with 50 And then he begins to bargain down from there from 50 to 45 and 45 to 40, then to 30, then to 20, and then on down to 10. Here's what Abraham seems to understand that is fascinating because up to this point, no Bible for Abraham. He's not like you and I who have four or five copies of the thing, one in the dash of our car getting sun rotted, the one family Bible that maybe stays on the coffee table or on the shelf, you know, then the Bible that maybe you carry with you everywhere that you go, or maybe you don't. Maybe you keep one at your place of work. Maybe you have one in the kitchen or the dining room or wherever. They're all over the place in most American households, whether you go to church or not. But nevertheless, our insight today seems to be so much more diminished than the insight of Abraham, who does not have the Holy Scriptures laid out before him. But what is it that Abraham seems to understand? Abraham seems to understand God's tendency to keep a remnant for himself and to act in graciousness not only towards that remnant, but even towards those who surround them. That God is much more likely to show favor and kindness even to wicked who dwell among his righteous than he is to show wrath towards his righteous that dwell among the wicked. Abraham has picked up on this. Abraham remembers the stories that have probably been handed down to him of how God kept a remnant when he kept Noah and his family from the flood. The last time that we saw God act in his perfect righteousness when he swept away wicked mankind with the flood, but kept Noah and his family, the remnant, by faith. So Abraham here, whenever he asks the question, suppose there are 50 righteous within the city, he doesn't merely mean moral righteousness. That's certainly included. But he's not here talking about merely their way of living. He is talking about those who have been declared righteous much as he was declared righteous. Now how was it that Abraham was declared righteous? Do you remember? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham here is thinking, okay, I am righteous having believed God. My nephew Lot is righteous, having believed God, despite his knuckleheadedness. And surely this righteous nephew of mine, Lot, who is now dwelling in the midst of Sodom, surely he has made a proselyte or two. Think about Abraham. Here he is, this king, who now has three or four or five other kings and their people under him. And God comes and says, circumcise yourself and your household and those who are under you as well. Presumably all these kings and the people under them now get circumcised. Because remember, Abraham is kind of the top dog. Abraham's thinking, surely it has fared so with my nephew Lot. Surely he's, he's gotten at least 50 proselytes. I mean, there's him, there's his wife, there's his two daughters, there's his two sons and his two sons-in-laws. I mean, that's eight right there. You only need 42 more, bro. Let's go. So for 50, Lord, will you spare it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare is the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Abraham appeals towards God here in light of his justice, his righteousness, 
And God responds exactly how we should expect a just and righteous and holy and kind and gracious God to respond. Verse 26, the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And Abraham pauses. He remembers his nephew is indeed a knucklehead. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? Abraham is beginning to backpedal just a little bit here. And notice what he does as Abraham intercedes for these wicked individuals. The wickedness of Sodom was very great as the end of chapter 13 tells us. And Abraham here takes on the role of a priest and begins to intercede for them because of the righteous that might very well be there. And just as anyone who who so sees fit to intercede for another does, he acknowledges his own position. I who am but dust and ashes... Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. We destroy the whole city for lack of five. And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose forty are found there. He answered, for the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let the Lord not be angry, and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. God is in the practice, in the habit of always establishing and keeping a remnant of his grace, a remnant of his righteousness. And God promises here that he will indeed not act because of those righteous. Now, again, we know the rest of the story. God is indeed going to go on to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because indeed there were not ten righteous there. Unfortunately, it appears as we move forward in the story that there's not even eight righteous there because Lot's wife turns around and looks just like she was told not to do and turns into a pillar of salt. Seven righteous individuals. And so you would think God having said, I will not destroy it if I find ten there, and having only found seven, destroyed everybody, right? Again, we know the rest of the story, and we'll see next week that God rescues Lot. God protects the righteous from their own wickedness and from the wickedness of those that would surround them. This is why when we sing psalms here, we sing those psalms that that cry out, Oh, Lord, protect me from the evildoer. Oh, Lord, let the wicked be far from me. We can sing these truthfully because that is exactly what God promises to do for His people, to guard them against not only their own wickedness, but also of the wickedness that would surround them. So this is how God deals with Abraham. And this is how God deals with his covenant people. And what is it that we need to leave this story with in mind? Yes, that God deals with his covenant people in a covenantal way. Yes, indeed, that God offers a particular uh, realization of his will to his people who he has entered into covenant with. Yes, indeed, that God is a just God, a righteous God, and a holy God. Yes, and amen to all of that. Yes, that God indeed will spare even the wicked for the sake of the righteous. Yes, by all means, we should indeed see that here. But let us not walk away from here without acknowledging the ultimate reality and truth and reason that we gather here each and every single week. That as I told the kids, that I stand before you and you sit before me, left to yourself being absolutely no more morally upright, no more righteous, no more holy, no more good than the very people of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, we're never the, the hero in the story. Left to ourselves, we're not Abraham. Left to ourselves, we're not even knuckleheaded Lot. Left to ourselves... We are the wicked people of Sodom and Gomorrah, who, as Ezekiel reminds us, were enamored with all of their wealth and all of their possessions and failed to show kindness and love and hospitality to the strangers that were among them and then partook in even greater wickedness than that. That's us, left to ourselves. What's the hope? What's the remedy? Jesus Christ, the ultimate seed of the serpent that caused all this wickedness in the first place. The seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent that caused all this wickedness in the first place. Jesus Christ, the singular promised offspring, as Paul says in Galatians, who is ultimately the promised child. 
that all of us by faith in that Jesus who came, lived a sinless life, and took on all of yours and my wickedness and unrighteousness and sin and filth and evil and all that we would do left to ourselves, Christ came and took all of that, that we might be declared righteous, that we might be declared just, that we might be declared holy, that Christ might present the church himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we stand here as recipients, not of God's justice, not of God's righteousness. We stand here as recipients of God's grace being declared righteous because of the righteousness of Christ imputed to you and to me by our faith in Him. That is what we were to take away from this text and every text that we come to in Genesis. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, let us not marvel at our own moral superiority and uprightness. Let us not rest in our good deeds and our good works. Let us never fall into arrogance in thinking that we have anything to offer before you and that we deserve anything from you short of your just and holy and righteous wrath and curse. But just as we are aware of that, Father, constantly remind us and heal our broken hearts with the balm of the gospel that Christ has taken that wrath and that curse on our behalf. And upon that realization, Father, help us to cry out to you in praise and in honor and in glory of your great and your holy name which you, for what you have done for us in Jesus. Father, help us always to look to him in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we think, in all that we believe, and in every way that we act. We ask it in his name. Amen.